thank you for joining me, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Aaron Rice, and I'm the Chief Information Officer at Vorbos. I'm going to be talking with you today about how we built a high-performing software engineering function using low-code tools. Now, if you haven't seen our uh, branding in London or you're not based in London, Vorbos is a next generation B2B fiber internet connectivity provider. We offer 10 gigabit minimum fiber internet connectivity to businesses in London. We start our pricing at just 650 pounds per month for an enterprise grade connection. And we can also offer uh, four resilient connections, i.e. two or more um, routes back from your office to our uh, data centers that ensure that your businesses are always online. There's no installation fees, just 12 month rolling contracts. Um, and this is quite rare in our industry. And the reason that we can do it is because we built the entire network ourselves from scratch. And for those of you that aren't in industry, that might sound like a given, an ISP that's gonna sell an internet connection, it's probably going to build the network themselves. But it's actually quite rare. It's a very expensive endeavor. It um, uh, takes a lot of very niche knowledge to go and dig up a city and install fiber and then sell that as a, for internet connectivity. But if you are going to do that, as a business, if you are going to go build a fiber network, then traditionally, you would do it in a pretty standard way. You'd use a lot of contractors to go and physically build and install the network. And those contractors, there will be some negotiation around their ways of working. There'll be some negotiation around how they manage their workforce and their processes. But ultimately, you are a passenger. You're also going to be using a lot of SaaS software, so software as a service. And software as a service for the installation and building of a fiber network is actually quite niched, um, unsurprisingly. Uh, it has a few number of customers in a lot of cases. Um, sometimes it's following some kind of cloud native best practices, but not often. And a lot of your processes as a business will be dictated by um, the, the capabilities of that software. And so you're going to have to make some compromises there as well. And then finally, you're likely going to tie it all together using enterprise software, things for your HR system, things for your, your sales process and similar. Now, it's fine, right? It kind of works for a lot of companies and a lot of companies are built this way, just fine. But when we closed our fundraising round um, to scale our operation back at the end of 2020, we asked ourselves, how are we going to change this industry if we follow in the same footsteps as the incumbents? And so after we closed that fundraising round, the very first thing that we went and did was build a school. We built a fiber academy and we trained permanent employees uh, out of industry, often straight out of school in what fiber is, how to install it, and our best practices for building a fiber network. All of these are, fiber, uh, are permanent employees with us. And that was our first foray into vertical integration. It's the reason I'm telling you this kind of preamble is we knew that from the successes of uh, being a vertically integrated business in our build, i.e. one that owns its supply chain with the purpose of uh, decreasing our spend, decreasing our complexity of, of uh, build and uh, having a lot more control over our, um, our building process. Because of the success of that, we realized that we need to do the same thing for our software. And so we had a preference to build rather than buy all of our software. So here we are, early 2021, with our budding new software engineering function, and we were building cloud-native 12-factor applications that were happily living inside of containers in our hybrid cloud environment. We were running those in Kubernetes. We were building applications and owning our data that the entire business were using. This was going great. There were people in the business who had never seen tools built bespoke for them before the tools that align to the processes that they've been carrying out sometimes on paper, sometimes in kind of uh, their own um, uh, tools and products that they've kind of prototyped together themselves. And the kind of ask because of the success constantly increased. We knew that we, in order to be successful with this, we're going to have to really look at our ways of working as a software engineering team. And so we went through uh, the kind of the classics. We went through looking at Scrum implementations of Agile. We looked at Kanban, and we eventually settled on the Spotify Squad model because it worked really well for us in being able to train engineers, um, share knowledge between them, and also get uh, iterations of products straight to our stakeholders really quickly. 
the goal for us was to not become a bottleneck to the business. You know, the machine's moving now. We've got these hundreds of people building a fiber network that are eventually going to go and sell. And we knew that we, we can't stop them. We can't make them wait for the tools that we're building. But as a company or as a team that the entire company is reliant on, you know, we've got these hundreds of people reliant on a single team. Eventually, the arse are going to get to a point where we will be a bottleneck. It's an inevitability. Now, this, this is something that, that comes up in, in most businesses and we tried our very best. You know, we're used to this as software engineers of, of managing these asks. We're used to dealing with the kind of cards we've been dealt in terms of a team, but because of the successes of the products we were building, we got to a point where finally, you know, we used to being the superheroes that are building products, but the business come to us and say, we need a new thing. And we kind of proudly turn to them and go, absolutely, it's coming. Don't you worry. It's scheduled for Q4 next year. Oh, no. That's not going to work, right? You've got an entire business blocked on a single team, and we're telling them that we don't have time to work on their products for months. And when you've got a business that's full of highly engaged, highly experienced, and highly intelligent people that are very driven towards a single goal, they're not going to just wait for a product or a tool to come about to do their job. What they're going to do is try and solve their problems. And that brings us into the kind of danger territory of uh, meeting the nemesis of a high-performing software engineering team, and that is shadow IT. Now, shadow IT is when a, a team, a non-technical team in a siloed way he builds a tool, buys a tool that solves their specific problems in isolation without a wider view on uh, data strategy, system strategy, or, um, or even communicating with other teams. It's your HR team uh, buying a uh, specific kind of compliance training product because it's not really what we're focused on as a business, so Spirit will go buy this thing. It's your uh, sales team engaging expensive consultancies to build Power BI dashboards to answer their questions without your knowledge. Now, don't get me wrong, in some businesses and in some contexts, this does make sense. You can make an active decision to incur a bit of technical debt, or you can make an active decision to not tackle a problem that isn't critical to your business. But it has to be a conversation, and your technical team has to be involved in it. And if they're not involved in it, you do enter the world of shadow IT. Now, most businesses run into shadow IT. It's not unexpected. And the way they solve it is either by adding resource to their software engineering function, adding more people to the team, adding more um, uh, you know, infrastructure and capabilities of that team in order for them to operate more efficiently. And the other way is in being a lot more targeted in what they are working on, what they choose to build themselves and what they choose to buy. Before we made that choice ourselves, we decided to look internally a little bit. Let's see if there's a way that we can kind of increase the, uh, the neck on that bottle before we go down the route of, um, uh, of just flat out mitigating shadow IT. And that highlighted for us three areas in which we spend a lot of time as a software engineering function. That's in requirement gathering, i.e. working with our stakeholders to understand what we need to build and why. It's in designing data models, i.e. taking those requirements and structure it in a vaguely uniform way such that we can interact with it with systems. And then it's actually building the create, read, update, and delete interfaces. Um, it's tabular views on data. It's the, um, the forms that put data into a uniform uh, system, being able to edit that data and being able to view it in a table. So that led us into looking at no and loco tools. Now, no and loco tools are systems that allow you to build products and tools and prototypes with very few, if any, lines of code. Very WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, very drag and drop in order to build systems that solve business problems. They look a bit like um, a cross between a spreadsheet and um, a database. Uh, they, if anyone remembers MS Access, it looks a little bit like that, but a lot shinier and hosted online. Um, there are things like Airtable, there are things like Retool, there are even things like Zapier, and Zapier is a tool that actually glues other tools together, sometimes low-code tools, sometimes uh, high-code tools, sometimes actual software engineering projects. And in this example here, we can see that without writing any code, we've gone from taking a lead in our kind of contact form all the way through to sending an email that that lead's been registered and then kind of cracking it in our CRM and reporting it into Slack. 
And all of that can happen without any code. As you can imagine, low and no code tools tend to get used inside of uh, teams in place of software engineering functions instead of them. Or in larger enterprises, they tend to be used as, um, as a small prototype building R&D teams, um, uh, tiny teams inside of big companies have very specific projects. Maybe it's a marketing team, maybe it's a, a you know, RevOps team or similar. But given that looking at our time sinks, a low-code tool is very good at designing data models because it's very similar to a spreadsheet, very similar, uh, simple tabular data. It's very good at building CRUD interfaces, and this is true pretty much across the board. Um, it looks like a, a form attached, attached to a spreadsheet, so it's relatively simple. We thought, why don't we give this a try? And really, the only thing that we're missing is the kind of requirement gathering stage. So here we are. Um, we went and physically met with our stakeholders. This is Rachel, one of the software engineers on the team, who's working with Neil, our head of procurement, in our warehouse. So you can see there's spools of fiber and subduct to actually stick in the ground there. And she went and started building prototypes with them. And what we found very quickly is that whilst we immediately solved the problem of um, data model building and um, product interface building, we very quickly automatically solved the problem of requirement gathering because we were sitting with our stakeholders, building these things live with them. Non-technical stakeholders didn't have to glaze over when they heard us talking about um, data models because they can see the thing in front of them. They didn't glaze over when we we're arguing as software engineers about the merits of using TypeScript versus JavaScript or similar, because we don't have to, it's all point and click. What you see is what you get. So we went and built some really cool systems on this, prototypes that ran on logistics functions, some of our HR systems and similar always working directly with these stakeholders. You can see here, these are like not very technical people um, that are uh, running some of the logistics and warehouse function, helping us build the prototypes that allow them to do their jobs more efficiently. The relationship between these non-technical teams and technical teams suddenly is great. And then we can start gluing these Airtable and Retool and other low-code tools together. So here, for example, we've kind of glued this um, an Airtable record with DocuSign. So at this point, we can create contracts legally binding contracts without writing a line of code. If you imagine as any software engineers in the room trying to put together uh, an integration with say DocuSign from your, from your high code environment, it takes hours at best, more like days, probably weeks of making sure that you've carried all the edge cases, they're all accounted for, everything's working properly, all the corner cases and the edge cases are covered. With this, it's not your problem. DocuSign's integration with Airtable, and Airtable's integration with DocuSign and Retool and similar, the engineers on those teams handle the, um, the relationships between the systems so that you can focus on the business logic. And it was going fantastically. And sometimes, yes, we did hit a limit of what the kind of no code the pointy clicky could support. And in those cases, we moved to low code. And low code is using um, the power of uh, software engi and engineering languages often JavaScript, to actually write a little bit of code inside of these low-code tools. You're writing code in a browser, in a browser-based IDE, and I use that in the loosest sense of the term. It's usually just uh, a text editor with some nice syntax highlighting, but you can pretty much write JavaScript. It's cut down a little bit, but you can write most of it in there. You can write SQL queries and similar inside of uh, your retool databases and similar. And it really expands the, the reach of these low-code tools. And so we were able to then uh, start adding business logic into these prototypes. And we're doing this so frequently that we ended up changing our low-code or our agile implementation to support the low-code environment. And we got this really lovely cut-down, simple process for building software in a low-code environment. We would go and work with our stakeholders, sit with them physically if possible, or, or sit on a Zoom call, understand what they're trying to get to in a couple of you know, quick conversation, understand that it is a problem that we should tackle rather than a problem that either we've already solved or one that we um, we don't want to solve at the moment for a technical reason. Then we sit with them, we build a lightweight MVP in these low-code tools together. And once we've built it, we've kind of sculpted out the data model, we've sculpted out what the ins and outs look like. We then operate it with the stakeholder. And once the stakeholder is comfortable using that thing, they're ready to fly on their own. We hand it over to them and then they're operating it. And then they're naturally going to find some improvements that are needed, some changes that are needed. And so we just iterate around this cycle over and over again. Identify new business requirements, build a prototype, work with the stakeholder, give it to the stakeholder. And it was going great. 
And what this also allowed us to do is because these kind of cycles are operating in hours to days, we can then be very targeted about the decision to build versus buy a product. Vertical integration doesn't mean that we build everything ourselves. It just means that we own some of our supply chain and we can be very targeted about when we own that supply chain. So for example, as a software engineering function, do we want to go and build our own payroll tracking, tax tracking systems? Maybe some of it, right? Maybe we'd want to track um, emissions of our sales team in a kind of, in a unique way. Maybe we want to adjust some of our business processes for how we commission sales team members or how we bonus, bonus our staff. But do we want to handle the kind of tax changes at the HMRC level? Those things are changing quite frequently. No, we definitely don't want to be building that ourselves. There are SaaS pieces of software and enterprise pieces of a kind of payroll and accounting software that have teams of accountants on staff to handle those changes. But the point is, because we're building low-code tools in seconds, minutes, hours, we can take the, um, the what is traditionally the predominant question when deciding build versus buy, and that is, do we have the resource to do this? Do we have the expertise to do this? Do we have the time to do this? Taking that out of the equation, and it leaves us just with the question of, should we be doing this? And in that case, we actually found that in, in a lot more situations, the answer was yes. So I'm sure I'm painting a very rosy picture of uh, using low and no code tools inside of a software engineering function at the moment. And for the most part, it is really great, but there is a catch. And that catch is in an environment where most uh, low and low code tools tend to be used as um, a replacement for a software engineering function. People are heavily incentivized as non-technical engineers, non-technical people, sorry, to um, have a go at this. But if you're relying on these low code tools and products as a business, you do have to think about data, whether you wrote code to build that data or whether you kind of dragged and dropped interfaces to build that data. There are things that still matter, data security, data um, uh, commonalities, you know, scalability of the data. Software engineers have this by default. We spent a lot of time working on what it means to build data. We spent a lot of time being woken up at 3 a.m. when we get it wrong. But non-technical stakeholders, non-technical people won't know what they don't know. So let's take a light, lightweight example of this. Let's say we want to grab our kind of dietary requirements of our team. We know both the technical and non-technical stakeholder would know that we'd need to gather an employee name and signature. It's simple. However, a non-technical stakeholder would probably capture this as free text. You know, we trust people to write their own name, right? No. Any software engineer knows that as soon as you add a free text box, someone is going to break it. They're going to miss type their name. They're going to add the email address. They're going to just type their first name or their nickname or something. And we haven't even got to the technical question here, which is dietary requirements. Imagine a free text box for uh, something like that. You're going to get, nope, I don't have anything. You're going to get random bits of data. You might get keyboards mashed. You might get, oh yeah, I do. Can you drop me a message? If a software engineer looked at this, they're going to be looking at making a uniform version of it. They're going to put drop down boxes for requirements with the option to add a bit more color if you need to. They're going to pull your employee details from somewhere else so that it's a select rather than enter. So you've got this data all uniform. And if you've got this data in a uniform way, you can then share it with other people. And that the power of data is in sharing and learning from it. With that, we actually, we realize that you, kind of, you don't learn um, the you don't learn the kind of deep intricacies of, uh, of managing data over tens of years. You pretty much get that quite quickly within a year or two because you've been woken up at 3 a.m. because when you get it wrong, the cost is so high. So very quickly you learn about data hygiene. So we actually use some of our least experienced software engineers to write and build low code products and tools. One of the things that they focused on was teaching non-technical stakeholders about technical tasks, which is a hard thing for software engineers to do. So they were upskilling themselves in that process and they started writing code in these low code tools. Not very experienced software engineers writing low code tools in quite a guardrail environment. But we did get to a point where perhaps we had too much code. So when you're writing code in these kind of low code editors, you don't have the niceties, you don't have CICD, you don't have tests, you don't have Git and version control, all of these things that have been solved in software engineering for decades. And experienced software engineers 
are very intolerant to that environment, and rightly so, because it requires a lot of rework to mitigate these solved problems elsewhere. You're getting code regression, you're getting typos, you're getting problems with engineers being able to write code at the same time as someone else. This is all extremely frustrating and ext extremely time consuming. So how do you manage lots of code and maintain lots of code in a low code tool? Well, you don't. We tried this, we tried to copy paste the code out of the editors into Git and to version control. It's not fail safe, it's not foolproof, it causes problems. So instead, we started pulling our business logic out of these tools and instead just firing events into higher code infrastructure. So for example, we're gonna take an Airtable as an example. We'd have a piece of code inside of Airtable as an automation that would simply raise an event to a queue somewhere, a queue that's sitting in our infrastructure built by very experienced software engineers. That could be a Kafka queue, it could be a RabbitMQ queue. Um, but the idea is it, record, it fires off a change event and then a containerized microservice or a Lambda functional similar can actually handle the business logic. And it can handle it in a way that systems are used to handling data. We've got lovely version control, we've got CICD, we've got tests, we've got peer review, we've got all the niceties of building real software engineers without all of the time consuming bits. And if we need to send data back to the low code tool, then we're doing it via another queue a message that's firing a webhook back to the system. Everyone's happy, right? We then took that and expanded it out, really built some complex uh, infrastructure for managing these low code tools. So we, I've already described the kind of inbound and outbound bit, but the real key was a service that syncs the data from the low code tools into a NoSQL DB inside of our infrastructure. The cool thing with that is that we were now replicating low code data structures in a high code environment. And that brings us to the kind of last point of this talk, which is you've heard me talk a lot about um, prototypes throughout this. And every time I mention these low code tools and products, I mention prototype. And that suggests that you know, we are a software engineer, uh, software engineering function. We are a vertically integrated business and we do want to build and own our own IP. And there will become times where a low and no code tool hits a limit of what it can provide. And at that point, it's time to graduate it into a high code tool but we don't want to be in an environment where they're blocking that team. We can't block the team that wants the product or wants the tool because then we're just back to being a bottleneck again. So we're syncing all of our data from our low code tools into our high code infrastructure and still having our uh, teams interact with the low code environment, knowing the data synced. Slightly then modified our um, agile process in that journey from low code to high code. and added two more steps. So we go from refining our business requirements to building those lightweight MVP prototypes. We operate them ourselves and then the stakeholder graduates to operating them. And then in the background, while the stakeholder is operating them, we go and replicate the data model in a high code environment. But we can do this in an automated way, either in a NoSQL world or a graph world, which is pretty much uh, automatic, or using some tooling to create SQL schemas from the low code data schemas. And that's a quick uh, automated tool. And then we're replicating our environment, replicating our data. And then when the time is right, we can spend some time building uh, high code interfaces on the replicated data. And when we finally hit the, uh, the last time is right, which is um, it's time to move off of the low code tool. And there are loads of reasons why we might need to move off the low code tool. For example, we might be in a world where um, we want to put more critical information in that. And at that point, you know, we don't want it on a SaaS low code tool. We don't even really want it on an internal low code tool. We want it structured nicely on our own products. It might be because we're just at a limit of what a low no code tool can do. But we get to the point where it's time. And we go and build this system in the background in a high code environment, such that the switchover is ours. It's a bit of training for a stakeholder rather than say, here comes version one, here comes version two, here comes version three over a year. It's just when we're ready, we switch it over. And using this model, we have built tens, maybe even hundreds now of products that are proprietary, that we own our data for, that our stakeholders are using, that in a lot of cases are industry leading. And we never block the business in building it, not once. And in part, 
That has helped us get to over 250 installation technicians. We've installed over 500 kilometers of fiber in zones one and two of London uh, over the last two years. And we have a really tight control over our installation and QA processes. We are a vertically integrated business, both in our build and in our software and tooling. All of our supply chain is owned by us and we don't have any shadow IT. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions if we've got time? Amazing, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we've got 10 minutes. If there's um, if there's questions, I'll keep an eye on the Q&A now. Nice. If you want to chuck questions in the Q&A or the chat, I've got both of them up at the same time, so. Yeah, I've just opened those up myself. As we prepare for the the break before lunch, oh yeah, always a, always, it's always a yeah, always a quieter time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what: if you don't have any questions now, please feel free to add me on LinkedIn. If you just search for Aaron Rice, you'll be able to find me. Um, always happy to chat. Always happy um, to hear questions. And we are hiring, so we're looking for software engineers in data and in infrastructure. Um, we are looking for senior lead level engineers that want to do things differently. We've got one question. Um, fantastic talk. Thanks. Love that. Thank you. Um, did you have any E and E to E testing around low code systems? This is a great question. Um, in some cases, yes. So in some cases we're able to do some things like actually just browser based, like Selenium testing and similar to look for outputs, but low code tools for all of their, um, their kind of merits and benefits. Some of their problems is that they, they start from that kind of stakeholder view rather from, than from a software engineering view. And I do think this will change in time as we as software engineering teams start to adopt it. But because of that, there aren't that many capabilities or, uh, or abilities to run for end-to-end -end tests. So we actually found that the best way was pulling out the business logic from the low-code tools and sticking them into high-code environments where we can run those end-to-end -end tests. But thanks for the question. Um, such an interesting presentation. Thank you. Did you find uh, you had some early adopters among the non-technical employees uh, who you lost along the no-code, low-code journey because they decided to become more technical themselves? <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, so that was the, we had that happen quite frequently. Um, my original view on this and the original strategy I set was that it could be self-service. So anyone is welcome to go build a low-code tool and we will be on call to help out. That very quickly fell over because very quickly we had the shadow IT problem. Not shadow IT in terms of going to use an external uh, company or external product, but in people building prototypes themselves with no true view on data and then uh, not telling us about it. And then us getting to a point where we're kind of saturated with information or we've, we're really deep into a team having learned a tool that doesn't follow any best practice for data. And that's a, that's a painful place for us to be because we can't share the data with anyone else. So I then flipped that strategy on its head and said, we will be the ones that build the tools for you in low-code environments. And a few outliers popped up from there, a few trusted people who um, really took to it like a, a, a duck like water. And then we allowed them to go build tools themselves. And you know, we're, everyone wins there. You get people upskilling themselves in their careers, becoming technical. And some of those actually ended up joining the software engineering team. And also we have more resource available, more people available, more time available to go do other, other things. And thanks for the question, that's a good one. Donna, who asked uh, the first question also, you seem to have inspired him to go play around with uh, low mm -hmm. code now. So uh, if nothing else came off that presentation, that, that's what we've got. Yeah, nice. We'll give it two more minutes just to see if there's any final questions that come in. What kind of apps? Uh, what kind of what kind of the apps you built for stakeholders using low code models? How did you host those apps? Is it on the cloud? Yeah, so it's a bit of a mix actually. So we, um, uh, in terms of the products that we built, it was anything from um, uh, prototypes for tracking kind of uh, the logistics function of our business. So we built a prototype for our warehouse management, our asset management systems. Um, all the way through to some of our HR systems, not all of them, but some of them, and then um, 
cracking our skills and uh, installation teams and upskilling them. Lots and lots of tools, things that you would tend to go to market for. We even started um, the process of building our CRM internally rather than using third party ones. Um, and in terms of where we host it, it's a mix, right? We don't want PII living in cloud forever. We're able to be audited against um, certain types of secure data uh, living in uh, SaaS products and cloud products because it's quite common these days. But for our own risk tolerance, I don't want it living there long term. So we did move in a lot of cases from a cloud-based low-code tool into a self-hosted low-code tool. And we host that on Kubernetes inside of our own firewalls in a well-architected framework aligned cloud infrastructure environment. Great. So I'll call time on this. Um, thank you so much to Aaron for presenting on this. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the presentation. As you said, Vorbos are hiring right now. Um, so good opportunities in the organization if you're looking for a new role.